Hello everyone, welcome today in the last web plenary. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, to introduce Angelica, and of course she's already been uh, formally introduced at the beginning of yes, so I'm not going to repeat things that you already heard. Uh, I can just say, in case you haven't noticed, that uh, Angelica is a hard-working person. Angelica is a patient person. She likes listening. She enjoys helping. I haven't ever heard her uh, refuse to give help to anybody. But please, don't take advantage of it. Uh, so we are uh, really glad to have her among us. Uh, please, Angelica, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I will talk in this talk about the role of theory in a research framework. It is a general topic, and I will illustrate uh, this uh, aspect with examples. At first, I will talk about notions of theory. Then I will present an example about two theoretical frameworks who have challenged each other and arrived at a new kind of concept. And in the second example, I will uh, illustrate a, an example that followed a uh, conceptual framework. And finally, I will reflect on the advantages and disadvantages of the two frameworks. I will start with a mathematical topic, uh, a dodecahedron. A dodecahedron is a geometrical object. But when we uh, look from outside and project the vertices and edges onto a plane, then we get a dodecahedron graph, which is an object of graph theory. And so we gain two kinds of background theories. One is Euclidean geometry, and the other one graph theory. And the dodecahedron resides directly between the both. And we could also get another one. So when we look at the symmetry concept and groups of the dodecahedron, and if we want to know a bit more about this object or phenomenon, then we build what I would call a foreground theory about the dodecahedron and its regularity features of the platonic solid and a bit more. This distinction uh, of the two kinds of theories can also be made in mathematics education. But there, a background theory is mostly consistent, a consistent philosophical stance of or about mathematical education, which constitutes a researchable question, methods, and situations as perceived by the researcher. A foreground theory is a local theory about a specific object. When you want to investigate something, you would uh, most likely develop foreground theoretical knowledge. It depends on the aim of research. For example, when you want to investigate mistakes in using decimal numbers and its explanation. So these foreground theories um, can be used or described or constructed uh, to describe a theoretical uh, a, a phenomenon with theoretical terms. It may allow to understand or explain something, predict something, or prescribe, prescribe something. For example, the value of means for learning a specific topic. So what do we mean by a theory in our field? Still, we do not agree upon that. But that does not mean that there is no knowledge. There is knowledge. I'm going to uh, show some quotes. 
Morgan Smith, for example, looks at a theory as an organized network of concepts and claims linked in a connected hierarchy. In a completely other way, Meyer and Beck considers theories. Theories are, in their sense, individual and social constructions which serve to understand and describe a part of reality in a consistent manner. Another view is um, proposed by Mason and Wayward. It means to understand what are taken to be the things that can be questions and what counts as an answer to this questioning. And more deeply related to research, a quote by Bishop, a theory is the way in which we present the knowledge and understanding that comes from any particular research study. Theory is the essential product of the research activities, and theorizing, therefore, its essential goal. And I think that about theorizing, the important role of theorizing, most of our researchers in the field would agree. So what do we share? Theories provide a lens and a language, consist of concepts and claims, address phenomena, making us see and understand or explain a specific kind of reality. Um, more than 10 years ago, Lewis Redford has provided a definition, which I find very useful because it is so practical. Um, he says, a theory can be seen as a way of producing understandings and ways of acting based on three features. First, a system, P, of basic principles, which includes implicit views and explicit statements that delineate the frontier of what will be the universe of discourse and the adopted research perspective. Uh, principles do not change very often. They are more or less a stable part of theories. And then there are methodologies. Methodology is the logic behind the method that has to relate to the principle. And this methodology um, also is about techniques, data collections, and the choice of methods. And thirdly, uh, it entails a paradigm a, a set of paradigmatic questions. These are not concrete questions, but templates or schemas that generate specific questions as new interpretations arise or as the principles are deepened and expanded. And there is a shortcut he uses, P and Q, and this is uh, the first step. Four years later, he has um, expanded it. He looks at theories as dynamic kinds of things. They evolve, they develop, and the way through which they develop is research. Therefore, the research results, they often refer back to the theory, to the principle, methodology, and uh, questions, for example. And they get more mature, they are broadened, and so on. So let's look at the first example. In this first example, two theories are used uh, to analyze the same data set, and they uh, challenge each other. I will um, yeah, show it now. In this example, students explore the exponential function with Capri. What the students just see in the situation is this screen, this screen, computer screen, where the exponential function is shown and a tangent. Then the teacher says, how does the exponential function grow for very big x? The student, G, then answers, but always for a very big x, this straight line pointing to the screen, when they meet each other, there is again, there is approximate the functions very well. The teacher astonished. What straight line? Sorry. And the student this. This for x, very, very big. So the view of the student 
is that the graph of the function can be approximated by a vertical line. He shows this. What uh, he shows what he means by his gesture: left hand going up. And the second step is the teacher. Will they meet each other? He asks, and he crosses his fingers, indicating that this, of course, happens. That uh, any vertical line will be met by the graph of the exponential function. And then thirdly, we look at both of them. The student's answer, yes, yes, it makes so, touching both hands together, where the teacher crosses the two fingers. So the view seems rather different. And a bit later, the student says that is at a certain point, that is, if the function increases more and more and more and more, then it also becomes almost a vertical straight line. The teacher. A, this is what seems to you by looking at, at the screen, of course, but you have here x equals 100 billion. Is this barrier overcome sooner or later? From here, the, te the students only briefly answers yes, no, infinite, and is not engaged anymore. So what happens here? We look at this data set from the semiotic bundle perspective. A semiotic bundle uh, consists of a set of gestures, speech, and graphical representation, which are related during the interaction and engagement. And this semiotic bundle, uh, it develops. And in this bundle, the teacher uh, plays a semiotic game by tuning with the student's words and introducing gestures that focus on specific aspects of mathematics. Here we see that the teacher tries to indicate that the vertical line, any vertical line, is crossed by the graph of the exponential function. But the student engages a bit, but does not really profit from this semiotic game. The second approach is that of the interest and situation. I refer to my first talk, but here I will only focus on the epistemic aspect. So there are three epistemic actions, gathering mathematical meanings, connecting mathematical meanings, and structure seeing. The diagram is a diagram that we use to analyze long, long procedures of data and compress them, make them much shorter. On the upper row, you can see that the gestures are indicated by a G. And before the middle rectangle, we see that the gestures of the teacher and the students are separated. And the teacher himself. He initiates, shown by the arrows, a lot of ideas, whereas the students at the beginning gathers meaning, says something, and so this is expressed by the dots. And in the rectangle, this all of a sudden changes. Gestures are exchanged, and the students begin to connect these meaning shown by the open rectangles, which are nested and interconnected. And after this rectangle, the situation changes. So what happens here? An interest then situation appears with a deep involvement of the students. And all of a sudden, it is cut off. And it's just cut off at the situation I have uh, shown before. As a student says, that is, at a certain point, that is, if the function increases more and more, then it also becomes almost a vertical line. And the teacher says, this is what seems to you by looking at. That means the teacher says, that's wrong what you look at. And that means that the argumentation base of the student is gone. So he was not anymore able to engage in this discussion. So what happens here? There are two theoretical perspectives combined. And uh, one is the interest and situation. It dries up. And the semiotic bundle, which means that the semiotic game is successful. They could conduct it. But the student does not profit from it. And the deeper question is why this happened. And this is a situation um, 
of um, collaboration between Ferdinando Azarello from Turin and uh, we from Bremen. And I traveled to Turin for a whole week and we investigated the data and got deeply involved until we came up with the solution. So I will go into more detail to show what happens. Big X is associated with top location by the students, shown by the gesture, and with right location by the teacher so that he shows where the coordinate, the abscissa, goes. And this shows a dissonance in gesture, but there is also a dissonance in speech. And this dissonance reflects two kinds of epistemic or epistemological resources. The teacher uses his formal knowledge that he has brought about his knowledge on mathematics in general. The student, on the other hand, looks at the screen. These are perceptual facts that he can use, and he cannot go beyond this. And this difference causes what we call an epistemological gap. This gap appears in many situations in the classroom. And the student, of course, cannot close this gap, nor can the student bridge this gap. It is the task of the teacher to bridge this gap. Well, look, let's look back at what we have done on the level of theories. Um, this case I just presented is a networking case of locally integration of two theories. And when we refer to Redford's concept of theories, we can um, reflect on what happened. So we had a common question. We shared this question, why does a teacher-student interaction not work? We had a common principle that we added. We added an epistemological dimension and worked this out based on research on personal epistemologies. And we merged both methodologies into the same one. So it was really necessary that I went to uh, Turin and the, that we worked together, because through this kind of working, we established a common methodology. So this way, um, the two theories were expanded, and they even were bridged. So what did the networking of two theories offer in this case? So it improved our data interpretation. We could understand now what was happening much deeper than before. It improved each theory. But it improved also us as researchers, our knowledge after this research and the result, um, each of us was a bit different than before. We now look at the second example, where a conceptual framework is presented. This example is about two disciplines working together to, get a, to gain a common design. Our question was, how can solving equations be supported in a multi-model way? Our aim was to develop a digital tool to learn algebra in a multi-model way. And this was called later the MAL system. And the project is called the MAL project. Based on conceptual learning, we wanted to establish this design. And uh, that means that um, mathematics education was supposed to go into the design from the beginning, also into the technical design, where the group of information technologists um, that, were mature, that was very much related to um, human-computer interaction was also included in our way of thinking. And we were included into the other discipline, not really in the technical side, but uh, in the way how the design proceeded. And this was, of course, a real challenge. So let's 
we arrive with situation. We come from the symbolic system of algebra and want to design a MAL system. So according to the theory of uh, interface design by Gogan, this design can be taken as a morphism. That means as a mapping that preserves certain structural elements. And these structural elements are those structural elements that we wanted to keep. Um, and what was the structural uh, elements, what were this about? The variables and numbers and algebraic expressions should be represented by tiles and algebraic operation with the object represented by the action. Let's um, now look at how learning happens. Learning happens in the other direction. The students, students were thought to use the MAL system as a didactic learning model, but this does not mean that they learn everything about symbolic, the symbolic system of algebra. That means the MAL representation has to be expanded. And for that reason, additional tasks and the teacher has to be involved. How does it look like? Let's look at the final result. This is um, the display of uh, the MAL system. Let's ignore the buttons uh, that are gray and there. We only look on the map. Um, here, the task is given. As it says that 2 minus 3 has to be solved with this MAL system by students at grade 5 who do not know anything about negative numbers. And what we see are squared unit tiles, blue and red, the blue one. Uh, mean unit tiles, meaning that ex, um, it, it represents one. And the red tile also one, but the, the color red um, represents the negative sign, whereas the color blue represents the positive sign. Let's now look at a video. So on the left side, so we start the video now. The 2 is represented. Then a block is drawn, and that is the subtraction zone. In the subtraction zone, three tiles are included. And the same is done on the right side. So we have an arithmetic equality. To keep the equality, the uh, tiles can be removed from the um, addition zone as well as from the subtraction zone. And finally, we gain 0 minus 1. And how can we solve it? We can solve it by including a 0 pair, which together makes 0. And then we have a blue tile on the addition and the subtraction zone, which both can be removed. And if we get rid of the subtraction zone, we have one tile left, which then can be defined as minus 1. So here you have a, a situation in the arithmetic. And let's get rid of the, um, the video. Thanks. And in the algebra, we have designed a division gesture. A division gesture, uh, which means dividing an equation by 3, for example, and solving this way, the equation 3x equals 9, uh, means that we have to conduct two steps. On both sides, we find tiles. On the left side, 3x tiles, because x is a long rectangle uh, tile, whereas the unit tiles are squares. And on the right side, we have 9. And when we group the left and the right side into the same number of equally sized group, uh, groups, then we can separate these uh, groups or assign each, groups to each group to the other group. And this way, we gain three sub-equations. All the sub-equations keep the equality relation the same. And therefore, we can get rid of 
both or two of them and just keep one. And the system just uh, deletes the other two this way that you see it. So this division gesture was investigated with students. And we wanted to know how teaching learning with the MILE system takes place. And the study used a conceptual framework to, to investigate specifically the division gesture in the MILE system. Let's look back how learning takes place. Learning takes place from the MILE system to the symbolic system, where the MILE system um, serves as a didactical model. So, uh, how did we uh, frame the research? We used um, the concept of learning from didactical model um, that was introduced by English and Halford, but also others have used the same. And then we based uh, the design of task and the division gesture on different areas of research. First, we founded, we made an epistemological foundation um, looking at what was out in arithmetic about dividing, and we used the partitive dividing uh, rather than the quant quantitative. Uh, then we based the design on guidelines for embodied experience supporting mathematical thinking. Uh, this is something that came out of a review paper, review done by Tran and uh, his colleagues. Finally, we used the concept of touch gesture as an indexical embodied design that provides feedback and thus supporting learning. So all these concepts um, are shaped uh, for the investigation that we in the following did. What did we do? We did multi-case studies for groups of student pairs with a tutor. We looked at equation solving, um, made video recordings, and in this case we focused on the division gesture because this was new and we wanted to know how the use of the division gesture worked. And the analysis was done by analyzing the actions that were driven, driven by goals of, goals of the task given and interaction, which was supported by digital feedback. The digital feedback was um, done in several ways. So the equal sign or the non-equal sign is one feedback. Then there was a translation of the mild representation into symbolic representation of algebra. But there are also several others. So also this blob of the uh, subtraction zone is a kind of feedback. So uh, we gained a lot of uh, knowledge. Uh, our paper has been just accepted. And it is in press. It will come out. I do a bit of advertising in the DEMA journal. So one result is interesting because it refers to uh, the conceptualizing of zero in algebra. That is really an obstacle of the student. So, um, Just a minute. Oops. That is really an obstacle of the students because of um, because they experience the following. On the left side, there are tiles, and they can um, partition the tiles that are really there. But when you look at these tiles and look at zero, what is a kind of partitioning of nothing? Um, yeah, how does it happen and what does it mean? You cannot partition nothing into smaller groups. And so the students were, yeah, pro were um, challenged to reconceptualize what zero in the sense of nothing means. And in this situation, we became aware why um, zero so often is um, a difficult concept for the students, specifically in uh, the area of algebra. Our 
research has also resulted in another kind of um, model that we have developed. Uh, so we have gained a four layers model of teaching and learning. First layer, the division gesture had to be learned, and the students had to learn how to conduct the division gesture. The second layer is the layer where the students learn with the MAL system, and in this case, about dividing by two, three, and, and any natural number. And there is a third layer, the layer where the students link the MAL symbols with the symbols of algebra. And then there is a fourth layer where the students emancipate from the MAL system. And uh, this layered model can also, and a similar layered model can also be seen in a recent paper by Sweden and uh, Sabina and Azarello. But in this case, it is a bit different. We have also the feedback, and the feedback experience, they mediate between teaching and learning uh, between the different layers. So. Um, let us now uh, look at the next slide and come to the reflection. Um, taking, if we look at the, the first examples, um, so we are going to reflect about the advantages now and disadvantages of the two frameworks. Uh, if we look at the first example, we have two theoretical frameworks. A theoretical framework has the advantage that it allows to draw inferences because of the coherent and consistent body of knowledge. But it also has a disadvantage. You observe what the theory allows to observe, going beyond the theory or beyond this kind of possible observation is difficult. It is an obstacle. In our example, I have described how this obstacle can be overcome by two theoretical frameworks working on the same set of data and challenging each other. The other framework, um, the other example showed a conceptual framework. Also, a conceptual framework has an advantage. It uh, sensitizes and addresses directly what is aimed at by a coherent body of concepts. But it has also a disadvantage. Results do not allow inferences or generalizations, consistent argumentation beyond, beyond the direct, direct um, uh, results is very critical. So what can we do? Because we aim at generalizing our results. So in a conceptual framework, uh, the discussion is very important. The discussion and interpretation of the data can lead and should lead into embedding the results into the knowledge of the field. When we look at the four layers knowledge, that is um, in some cases quite easy, in other cases more difficult. So if we look at layer one and two, then these two layers resonate very much with the instrumental genesis that was uh, a concept on a theory that was developed by Artig based on the work of Haberdell. So that means uh, we have to build schemas, and the schemas will allow us to use the artifact in a more proficient and innovative way. Um, and in our case, we can see this in the small artifact of uh, the division gesture. The layer three resonates very much with the semiotic representation uh, theory that Duval has provided. But in our case, it is a bit different. It um, is built on feedback, and it's also built on the two layers, um, on the two first layers. And thirdly, the question is how we can explain um, 
that students um, transform somehow while learning with the MAL system and arrive at least later in uh, the level where they emancipate from the MAL system. Activity theory is there very interesting. And I found a part where really Leontiev in a, in a book from 1979 wrote exactly about this situation. And what we now do and will do, we take this activity theory uh, background and will analyze the data that we have gathered already in arithmetic about learning negative numbers to see whether this model is a model that can be used and to find evidence of this model or replace it by another one or explore it further. So thank you for listening. Um, this was the MAL team. There were many people involved in the MAL project. And this is the team uh, of the Bremen Networking Theories Group, where also many, many more people have been involved.